My name is Lizzie Parker, and I head up the Prina Institute, the voice of Prina science. And it is my absolute privilege on behalf of WSAVA, Prina, and Zoetis to welcome you all to this highly relevant webinar, COVID-19 and companion animals, what we know today. All of us are being impacted by this extraordinary pandemic, whether personally or professionally. But it is also causing a lot of concern and uncertainty for pet owners around the world. At Perina, we believe that pets not only belong together, but they're better together. And never has there been a more important time when this special relationship and the companionship and the health benefits that our, our pets bring been more to the fore. But pets, healthy pets, they need their vets, not least to be able to help protect their health and well being. And clients are turning increasingly to their vets for the facts and reassurance that their pets will be okay during these times. But the big challenge that we all face is it's not only is this a new virus and the situation continues to evolve, but reports are being published that they are then being misrepresented by the media particularly those involving cats and dogs. And this is also causing a lot of concern and distress amongst pet owners, but it also poses a very real and significant threat to pet welfare. All of us are very familiar with WSAVA and the role and the support that they bring to over 200,000 members around the world. And as a long-term partner with WSAVA and a proud sponsor of the One Health Committee. Pete Perino just wants to acknowledge and recognize the team that have been working tirelessly over these last months to ensure that we have all of the facts and information. And I would just like to make a particular call out to Professor Michael Day, who has been a driving force as always to ensure that we have this information at hand. So today we've got some world-renowned experts who are going to be able to bring you the evidence based on the facts that we know today, so that you will have the information to be able to reassure your clients, your coworkers and communities to give them the facts and the reassurance. So with that, and I said, extremely honored and proud to be part of this event, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Eileen Ball, who is the Global Medical Director for Zoetis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lizzie. I want to just briefly state that Soetis is grateful for this opportunity to support the FAVA and to have partnered with Purina to support this webinar and provide credible information for veterinarians so that we can all keep uh, up to date on these changing times. So thank you. And with that, I would like to things over to our first two speakers today. Um, these are two individuals that it's an absolute honor for me to have the opportunity to introduce. Uh, quite honestly, they don't need much of an introduction to anyone. Uh, we have Professor Michael Lappin from Colorado State University with us today. Uh, Dr. Lappin is board certified in internal medicine. He completed his veterinary medicine degree at Oklahoma State University and his internship and residency at the University of Georgia. And he is world renowned in the infectious disease space and has a tremendous amount of knowledge in this space and is, is going to bring great information today. We also have Professor Vanessa Bars who comes to us from the City University in Hong Kong who can give great perspective on the Asian aspects of this disease as they are somewhat more compressed in other parts than other parts of the world. And uh, Professor Bars completed her veterinary education at the University of Sydney in Australia. And she was on faculty there as a professor for many, many years as well. And with that, I'd like to turn everything over to Dr. Lappin. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, morning, evening to everyone joining us today. This is Mike Lappin sitting in Fort Collins, Colorado with about a third of a meter of snow on the ground to go along with our pandemic. 
I am very honored to have been selected to be part of this webinar with Dr. Bars and Dr. Ryan. Uh, very sad that my close friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Day, couldn't be with us uh, presenting today, but he's with us uh, in, at a distance. Vanessa and I plan on going back and forth together because we have certain areas of interest and potential strengths to build into this talk. And I like to always say that I got to first work with Dr. Bars when she was uh, just a baby veterinarian in her residency in feline medicine. How are things on the other side of the world today, Dr. Bars? Hi, Dr. Lappin. Well, I'm here in Hong Kong. It's 10 p.m. at night and uh, things, are, things, are, things are good. We don't have any snow, but we're, we're doing good and uh, it's really good to be here with you all. Well, guys, now that you know us a little bit, we'd like to go forward with our information for you today. First, again, to acknowledge the dream of Michael Day, one of, one of many, was to have the One Health Committee. I think Michael was one of the companion animal people that first realized that wasava could be so instrumental in uniting people together in the One Health concept. In particular, zoonotic diseases, comparative oncology, and, and many other pathways. As you probably know, we have representatives from the CDC on our One Health Committee, as well as OIE. And so, in general, we work very closely together with our opinions and our guidelines. We believe that we have great strength in being able to disseminate accurate information through our 113 associations which then reach over 200,000 veterinarians. So hopefully you've been following some of our bodies of work over time, and I'll share with you some of the things that we're doing to try to help during this pandemic. One of the things that we've recently done is uh, endorse the AAFP zoonosis guidelines, and we were quite proud to have ISFM on that particular endorsement as well. But isn't it amazing? We published these in December of 2019. And over the weekend, I'll be working on a position piece for the journal talking about reverse zoonoses because we have this new virus that we need to now make a statement to add to our zoonosis guidelines. But good news as we end the talk today together, we will be making the conclusion that evidence of cats to people of SARS-CoV-2 is still not present, no evidence for that. But it is great to be able to have these global guidelines uh, with the media now, uh, having access to things so quickly, we do wanna be able to give our constituents that kind of filtered version where we try to provide uh, accuracy. Vanessa and I, and I'm sure Shane as well, we uh, all work with different drug companies. I currently have a relationship scientifically with Zoetis, uh, many, many projects right now with Purina, but those relationships obviously do not uh, impact a lecture of this type. Our scientific disclosure, however, I think is, is quite important to us because what we say today seems correct and true, but things are changing so rapidly I'm sure you all are doing it as well. There are three or four or five new things to have to consider relevance to our situation every morning when I turn on my computer. So again, some of the things in this talk may be changing quickly in the coming weeks. So what we did at the Wasava level is the One Health Committee partnered with the Scientific Advisory Committee. So Frederick Gashin uh, has been helping Mary Mary has just been amazing. If you haven't worked with Mary Racondes yet, uh, she's also on the Vaccine Guidelines Committee with Michael Day, the founder of One Health. Shout outs obviously to our president, uh, Shane, but our team with the media, Rebecca, Emma, it's just been quite the, the group effort to try to harness so many different uh, factoids to get it uh, in a, a digestible way on our website. So please check the website if you haven't. We are uh, providing uh, e-shots, uh, which would be statements about what we think 
about some of these new findings on a weekly basis, and sometimes twice a week if there's new information that we think needs to make comment. We communicate by directing uh, discussions directly to the delegates of those 113 associations, and we certainly uh, make liberal use of press releases as indicated. But congrats to all that team for working really hard to have our source site uh, up and running. So to get to the meat of the lecture today, all of us have become quite unfond of coronaviruses, all of us that do veterinary health care. The FIP coronavirus, it's been one of the banes of our existence. Vanessa and I are both uh, quite heavily interested in cats. The enteric coronaviruses, not so exciting, thankfully, and even our one beta coronavirus in small companion animals, the canine respiratory coronavirus, that's part of the, the CIRDC complex, the old kennel cough complex. We're used to these viruses, but we weren't ready for SARS-CoV-1. Back in 2002, 2003, that first infection in this class of betas that infect people and cause fairly significant disease was our predecessor. Shortly thereafter, the Middle East SARS virus and now the new mutant uh, SARS-CoV-2. So just to confirm our definitions, the virus is the SARS coronavirus 2 that we're dealing with now. The disease syndrome in people is COVID-19. Very important, I think, for us to work with our constituents, especially lay people, because sometimes the definitions are lost with the people that aren't in the sciences and sometimes leads to some confusion. Like, for example, some of the early cruise ship data where it was stated that this virus was on railings in the ships for as long as 17 days. Well, that made people feel that SARS-CoV-2 would actually live for 17 days. But that work was actually based on polymerase chain reaction, which is a fantastic tool to prove nucleic acids of virus, bacteria, et cetera. In this case, we do quantitative reverse transcriptase, PCR, but that doesn't actually prove the virus is live. And so Vanessa will be speaking to the first Pomeranian uh, Hong Kong experience in a few minutes. But what we have to do when we're using PCR is discriminate whether or not it's just from contaminated environment, it's not actually living virus versus the virus is still there and potentially effective. And that's where virus isolation for culture can really help us because that proves the virus collected from a surface, a nasal swab, a rectal swab, proves that the virus was still viable. And then ultimately, as we've known for many, many years, serology can be beneficial in helping with sorting out epidemiologically as well as what's happening with one animal because the body is gonna exclude most things that it's not interested in. You're probably not going to make antibodies unless that virus, bacteria, protozoan. You're probably not going to make antibodies unless it's truly infecting you. And so right now with SARS-CoV-2, we believe obviously that virus isolation proves live virus in that particular sample. The higher level PCRs are being persistently PCR positive while not always proving live virus probably proves current infection. And then zero positivity that might develop a little bit later also probably suggests that the body cared enough to react and an infection probably existed at least at some time. So I thought this would be a great segue to Vanessa now because I can't tell you, there's probably never been a lot of discussion about one virus from that outbreak in 2013 until this pandemic. Can you share this with us, uh, Vanessa? Yeah. Thanks, Mike. And in fact, the, the SARS epidemic in 2003 gives some insights into why Hong Kong was proactive in testing companion animals in the current COVID-19 pandemic. So during that SARS outbreak in 2003, there was a large cluster of infections in a housing estate in Hong Kong 
And most of those cases were from people living in one block of flats above or below each other with no direct contact. So there was an investigation to determine whether pests might be involved in direct spread, pests like rats and cockroaches, and they were quickly ruled out. And later, as we know, it was actually aerosol spread from sewage drains that was identified as the cause of transmission. But before finding that out, investigators also collected samples from cats and dogs living in that same housing estate where there was that large cluster of infections. So we go to the next slide. Thank you, Lap. So uh, during that SARS coronavirus outbreak in 2003, the investigators collected uh, swabs from cats and dogs living on the estate over a 14 day period. And what they found for the first time was that eight cats and one dog tested positive on multiple swabs by PCR on consecutive days. And they did culture virus from the cats and five of the cats were also seropositive, confirming that they were infected. But importantly, none of those animals were sick and there was no evidence during the SARS coronavirus outbreak of 2003 of any animal to human transmission. Okay, so as a follow-up to uh, the finding of natural infection of cats and dogs, uh, in the SARS coronavirus outbreak, investigators then looked at experimental infections to look at whether cats and ferrets were susceptible um, and what they also performed transmission studies. So they did infect a group of ferrets and cats intratracheally with SARS coronavirus that they obtained from a human patient. They took daily swabs from these animals and they also performed transmission studies by housing those animals with some uninfected animals next to them. And what they found is that they confirmed that both cats and ferrets could be experimentally infected. None of the cats became ill. They all shed virus from their respiratory tract. The virus could be cultured. And they also found that the virus was transmitted to the in-contact cats, but neither of them became ill. And they found similar things with the ferrets, except some of the ferrets did become unwell and one of them died. So now we, uh, I'm going to hand back over to you, Mike. Yes, thanks very much for that historical lessons that we learned from the related but different SARS-CoV-1. But I think it's very relevant to our team today listening on the webinar because things kind of quieted down. We would, by definition, say that SARS-CoV-1 was a reverse zoonosis because cats became infected from exposure to people, experimental infection was confirmed. But please, uh, to restate, there was never evidence that it went then from a, a naturally infected cat into a human. Well, I think this will, at least in infectious disease people's minds, kind of live as one of those, what were you doing uh, on the day before New Year's uh, when the first postings from ProMed about this unexplained uh, pneumonia in Wuhan. I was at the bottom of the Grand Canyon on a hike, uh, and so we came quite interested on return from that trip. And it's amazing how a virus like this can become a global pandemic. The WHO numbers from just uh, three days ago are listed on the screen to your right, and it's uh, quite amazing that we could go to over 1.8 million suspected cases in really only about five months time. So that is a really, really, really sad occurrence. And, and I'm sure all of us will be glad when the curve continues to flatten. But once that started being recognized in China, Hong Kong, jumping to the European and, and Americas, it became quite interesting to veterinarians and veterinary health care providers about what about our constituents, the owners and their pets confirming what had been seen with SARS-CoV-1, remembering that viruses enter cells via receptors. This type of scientific work is fantastic because it does help predict which animals might be more permissive to letting a virus into the body. So these specific studies led to a lot of press about a month ago 
when this paper first surfaced was, was there going to be greater risk for illness in our cats and ferrets? And or is there going to ultimately be transmission from pets back to people? Well, this one was actually this week's excitement. Uh, congratulations to the authors of all people that get their work at least submitted for review. Uh, we certainly do want to always uh, give kudos for uh, publishing. But this is one of the great ones that will uh, require a little bit of debate over the next uh, months to years. Everyone always likes to know where a virus came from. Uh, it might be very important for our management strategies in the future. But the good news, as we'll learn, I think, in this next segment of the talk, is that whether the dogs were a part of a jump post or not, at least the dog itself is seemingly fairly resistant to infection with SARS-CoV-2. And so we'll get on to that discussion now. Thanks, Mike. And uh, here in Hong Kong, we've learned a lot of uh, information about what happens naturally in natural infections, which is quite different to what uh, potentially we see in experimental infections. So after the first COVID-19 cases were first diagnosed here in Hong Kong at the end of January 2020, the government introduced a temporary 14-day quarantine for the pets of COVID-19 patients. And they collected nasal, oral and rectal swabs from uh, these pets when they first were admitted into quarantine. And the first pets that they tested, a cat and a dog, both tested negative. Uh, but then, uh, as you would have seen, this 17-year-old uh, Pomeranian made headlines around the world uh, because this was the, the first pet to test positive in the current pandemic. And uh, there was a lot of debate uh, initially about whether this dog was actually infected or was it just contaminated from its owner? Uh, and then that debate was uh, really set, uh, set to rest uh, because the dog tested positive on multiple consecutive uh, swabs taken over a 12 day period. It tested positive on nasal and oral swabs. And in this particular case, infection was ultimately confirmed uh, because it did test antibody positive. It only had a low viral load and it did test uh, culture negative. But importantly, this cat, this dog rather, had no signs suggestive of COVID-19. No virus was cultured from its samples, so it wasn't contagious. And sadly, after this dog was released from quarantine, it did pass away and it was known to have underlying disease. There was no suggestion that this dog died as a result of COVID-19. So now we're almost two months down the track and uh, there's a lot more information uh, in Hong Kong uh, as a result of uh, 52 pet animals that have now been tested in quarantine. And that includes 18 cats and 30 dogs and, and even two hamsters. Uh, but of all those animals that have been tested, only three have tested positive. So in addition to the first dog, another German shepherd tested positive over a two day period. Uh, and infection was confirmed in that German Shepherd. It was positive on serology. Its culture, a culture of its uh, nasal swabs were also positive, but there was no transmission from this dog to the second dog in the household. And more recently, the uh, only cat to test positive in Hong Kong, uh, this is a, a young female cat. She tested positive over a five day period on nasal, oral and rectal swabs. Her serology is pending um, and culture is pending. And she also has shown no signs of COVID-19 and, and has been healthy during her time in quarantine. And then uh, another cat made the news headlines. This time the cat uh, from Belgium uh, became headline news on the 25th of March. So this cat's owner was self-isolating after being diagnosed with COVID-19 after a trip to Italy. And a week later, her own cat became unwell. And uh, this cat showed some signs uh, that uh, could be consistent with a coronavirus type infection. It was anorexic, it had some diarrhea, it was vomiting, and it had some breathing difficulties. Veterinarians were not able to uh, examine that cat. And so the owner did collect some samples of feces and vomit, and they were tested at the University of Liège by PCR. They did some sequencing and they did confirm the presence of SARS coronavirus 2. 
uh, but they weren't able to perform culture. Uh, the cat did get better and serology is pending from that cat. So we're gonna jump, I'm gonna jump back to you, Mike. Thanks a lot for that overview, Vanessa, of, of what's been going on on your side of the world. Uh, I tell you, that's probably the most pom uh, famous Pomeranian uh, in, the, in the world. Guys, it's really nice when you wake up, turn on the laptop and find at least a title that sounds uh, more refreshing than some that we've had over the last several weeks. I love seeing the word absence and veterinary in the same title. If you haven't had a chance to read this uh, pre-review paper yet, it's from our friends at the Pasteur Institute. It's uh, interesting because they were able to test 21 domestic pets that were living in close contact with a group of veterinary students. And as you can see on the summary statement, there were two confirmed students with clinical signs of COVID-19, but 11 of the other 18 also had clinical signs that could have been consistent. So I think where we're going so far is looking at the Hong Kong experience, this recent publication, to while reverse zoonosis is probably true, it's quite difficult to infect a dog or cat using the levels of virus that are likely present in a person that's currently sick. So yes, they occasionally do. And then what's still lacking, I wanna make sure we say this multiple times today, is in that handful of positive animals, transmission back to a human is not proven. Uh, this was an interesting wake up call one morning for me uh, with the Bronx Zoo being a little bit on the other side of our country, but, but provided some interesting uh, points to talk about because in this case, obviously the zookeeper that is the likely source of infection of these cats, this zookeeper probably wasn't cuddling with those animals for great lengths of time. So I know that led to a lot of fear that perhaps transmission could be quite easy. Obviously the other sick cats in this report weren't tested and so their dry cough can't be said 100% sure to be due to SARS-CoV-2, but they were in proximity, et cetera. Good news, other cats within the same exhibit area did not become sick, but how we, responded to this particular report, because that does lead to fears that then could those cats then infect others. It led to a lot of discussion about, well, what's gonna happen when we start getting results of experimental studies? And, and Vanessa, since you're kind of close to this action, could you take us a little bit through uh, what's been reported now? Yeah, sure, Mike. So this uh, paper first appeared in a preprint server, uh, Bio Archives, and uh, last week it was published in the journal Science. And these investigators performed infection and transmission studies in different animal species, including cats, dogs, ferrets, chickens, pigs, and even ducks. They infected small groups of these animals, and this time they used a large dose intranasally of a SARS-CoV-2 isolate from a human. And just like the SARS-CoV-1 experimental study, they did find that cats and ferrets were susceptible to infection when they were infected using a, a, a very high inoculum. They also found that dogs have low susceptibility and they found that pigs, chickens and ducks are not susceptible. If we look in a little more detail, they infect, they tried to infect five dogs and two of those dogs seroconverted uh, all of their viral cultures were negative and there was no transmission to other dogs. And if we look at a little more detail at the cats, they um, infected three young adult cats. None of them became sick, but all three shed the virus and all seroconverted. And they, they also performed a transmission study with the cats and they placed three uninfected cats in cages next to each infected cat. Only one of those three exposed cats became infected none of them were unwell. So this implied that the mode of transmission to the uninfected cat was likely by respiratory droplets. But of course, the findings in animals exposed to large doses of viruses experimentally are not necessarily the same as what happens in nature. And again, we've got this data in Hong Kong that 
you know, if you look at the 52 dogs and cats that were tested, these were animals that were in high risk, uh, high exposure environments less than 6% of dogs and cats were infected in that situation and none of them became unwell. So Vanessa, this is also an interesting finding that we wanted to respond to for, at Wasava because it does show, assuming that the assays uh, were performed correctly, which is why on this slide I've chosen to pick the 11 animals that were positive in both the experimental assay and then more of a classic virus neutralization type assay. This does confirm, again, more information saying that a cat exposed to an infected human could potentially become infected and have that evidenced by seroconverting. So now we've seen that in the field, we've seen that experimentally. So again, worthy of our concern. But what I think we all have to be careful with is simple wording of a press release or simple republishing data from another. The simple word of yet led to quite a lot of uh, interest uh, from this one posting. Well, the good news is this one, as you can see, is, is several weeks old now, uh, posted on April 1st, and that yet has still not occurred. So as we gather more and more information about sick people and their pets, the data still suggests that this virus doesn't really like dogs and cats, and that handful that do become infected shed for very short time periods, and right now no evidence that it passes on from that transient infection from a companion animal onto people. So just to give you an example of the types of e-shots that we'll continue to uh, provide over the coming months as we work through this pandemic is really to emphasize important things that you can share with your staff and your owners. We just have to be really careful. High dose experimental study is not the same as a natural infection study. And then Guys, I, I love the tiger postings. I feel the data is quite strong and interesting. But as we've known, those um, non-domestic cats, they have frequently, because of their genetic predispositions, maybe a little bit smaller gene pool, we really have a hard time comparing results from large cats to domestic. They might actually be more permissive to the virus uh, because of their uh, particular genetic makeup which I'm sure you've seen now uh, being discussed in the literature about why some of us get sicker than others. It's not just a virus and the dose of virus. There is still a host relationship with that. And then on the third, we concluded our e-shot with right now there's still no evidence of transmission from an infected companion animal to a human. And I think thankfully by the end of this webinar, we'll probably could repost this one with a new date. Now, living in the United States, we've been quite lucky to have uh, Antec, IDEX, uh, Zoetis now has worldwide laboratories. Uh, I'm part of the state diagnostic lab system. I, I run tests for the Colorado State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. And there have been many of us that have been attempting to help prepare to have tests available if it is determined by our public health authorities that routinely testing animals would be indicated. Uh, we've gone as far at CSU to go ahead and I acknowledge our director, Crispy Avalonia, for getting us through CLIA certification, which is a certification process in the United States so that we can test human samples. So it's just great to see the world mobilize, trying to get good antibody tests ready to go to help us determine things, having a good robust PCR assays and virus neutralization. It's all fantastic to have those things and we're ready. But I did want to point out that um, these are good news stories. We didn't have any positives at either laboratories with the sick dogs or cats that have been tested. And those animals were tested during the time that we knew that SARS-CoV-2 was in our country. And so that's comforting information because they weren't positive. But we have to also temper our enthusiasm a little bit 
because we don't really know how many of those samples were from animals that were directly exposed to the virus. Remember, they don't get it on the streets by themselves. It still has to be a human that inoculates that dog, cat, or ferret. And so this will be very uh, individualized based on different countries. Uh, Vanessa can speak to it here in a second. But again, it's going to be legislated in some areas. It will be suggested in others. And so we did also comment on the uh, policies from the uh, Center for Disease Control in the United States and our United States Department of Agriculture. They'll be the ones that will tell us when and if we can test individual animals or larger studies uh, using pets. In fact, gosh, it gets updated frequently. Here's just our example that just came out the day before yesterday via the CDC. Again, the CDC is a member uh, of, of our Wasaba One Health Committee, and so please pay particular attention to these. These are uh, quite well thought out uh, guidelines when they come from our friends uh, at that institution. But right now, recommendation of testing uh, individual pets is, is not recommended. As we've seen, they're unlikely to be infected anyway, based on the data that we have to date. They're even less likely to be ill because of the virus. And so you're probably going to be ending up spending lots of money on cats with herpes and dogs with kennel cough that probably aren't actually sick due to COVID-2. And then one of the things I've started chatting with people about is even though the tests are going to be robust, especially if they're through the well-known name brand laboratories or state accredited systems, even if it's a good and robust assay, the time you get the result back, the animal's probably well, if it was ever sick, and finish shedding. And so that individual animal testing is probably not going to be much benefit to your owners. And so gathering more information epidemiologically, I think, should be our goal in the coming months with companion animals, not so much individualized medicine to that animal that's likely not infected likely not sick due to that virus. So that's uh, some personalized opinions based on the supporting uh, documents uh, suggesting not testing right now in the United States. And, and Vanessa, before we talk a little bit about treatment, did, would you like to, to voice any opinions on uh, testing of domestic animals that are not in quarantine in Hong Kong and other Asian countries? Yeah, sure, Mike. I think uh, that there's really no no real indication for uh, individual testing at, at this stage. And I really agree with your comments that, uh, you know, doing epidemiological studies and doing surveillance is going to help us learn more about this virus. But uh, there's no real need for individual pet testing. Great. Thank, thank you for those comments. Uh, uh, Mike, again, just for a second. This was a fantastic paper. Uh, it was great to see in vitro work, uh, looking in, in our case, being selfish as a veterinary healthcare provider, looking at compounds that we feel comfortable with that might actually lessen uh, in vitro the replication of this virus. So congrats to these authors. However, I think we could throw this into the same category is we're not sure we need this yet. And we certainly don't know how to do it in a living animal. What's the living animal dose that we would use to lessen replication? And back to our earlier comments, it's hard to induce infection. They don't usually get sick and the shedding period's quite, quite low. So whether or not this will turn out to be a clinical veterinary thing uh, is, is certainly going to take uh, more months to sort out. But back to you, Vanessa, on, the, on some of the uh, prevention issues. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So we know that uh, humans are infected with SARS coronavirus 2 by close contact with other infected humans. And there's been a lot of discussion about fomite transmission, a fomite, of course, being something contaminated with virus that can then be transferred to cause infection to another person. So can COVID-19 be spread by fomites? And some interesting studies have come out recently, Mike, if we can go to the next slide. And uh, one that came out of uh, Hong Kong just uh, this week showed that in fact, uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 can survive on a Hong Kong banknote for, uh, for up to two days. 
They also found that it can survive on the outside of a face mask for seven days. So the way that we take our face masks off is, is quite important. Uh, but the good news is that, uh, of course, this virus is uh, very susceptible to most common disinfectants, uh, which is great news. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, the best way to avoid fomite transmission, as we know, is uh, if we go to the next slide, just by hand washing and, and hand, hand sanitizing. These really are the, the most important ways that we can prevent spread of infection, as, as everybody listening to this seminar would know. Yes, I tell you, we have had uh, some really uh, great discussions about PPE um, in, around the world because of shortages and donating to human health care facilities. So AVMA and the CDC have some great guidelines that people can review uh, and, and how best to balance our staff safety and animal welfare with the appropriate use of PPE. Those recommendations, we won't uh, spend a lot of time on you, uh, the webinar today, because you can read them, and this is only one veterinary association in collaboration with the CDC. But it is great to have some guidance for what to do if one of your long-term clients gets hospitalized and they don't have someone to help that animal get through its quarantine period at home. Obviously, we want these exposed animals that aren't sick. They need to stay in their home and they'll stop their shedding in short order, just like our human friends. But it is good to have some guidelines what to do if you have to have that animal in your facility. This one was directed mainly towards shelters, but I think it also includes those of you that are willing to bring in well animals into your hospital while the owners are recovering. So a couple of things that they emphasized, I think one we've already said, please keep those pets in the home if possible. And um, they made a statement at CDC, again, part of our team, is that there's no evidence that uh, bathing uh, helps in these situations. And there are, of course, some cons to handling an asymptomatic potential carrier. You've got to handle some grumpy cats that I hear, I hear sometimes in Hong Kong, the cats aren't, aren't the friendliest. Uh, and then of course, um, there's always a potential for if we're using the wrong detergents, things that are too harsh, for example, or disinfectant wipes, you know, there could be issues with skin disease. But at least in our country with our CDC also being internationally recognized, that basically keep them away from the sick person. We've been saying that before we knew it was a reverse zoonosis for sure, uh, to lessen their odds of being transiently infected, but that shall also pass. Any other comments on this particular uh, section, Vanessa? Ah, oh, yeah, look, um, I think uh, that it really raises the question about uh, fomite transmission on uh, on, on our pets' coats. And uh, look, here in Hong Kong, some, some pet owners uh, feel uh, comfortable uh, wiping their dog's paws after it's been out, outside. Uh, but it really does raise a question, if we can go to the next slide, about uh, you know, uh, survivability of this virus on, on cat and dog hair. And it's something that we don't have any information about. There's been no, no research. But you know, other studies with other RNA viruses like feline Khaleesi virus have shown that it doesn't survive well on hair. And so many international sources think that this is really probably going to be the same for SARS coronavirus too. And the probability of a cat or dog uh, having a virus on its coat that uh, can be transmitted to an owner is probably very, very low. So back to you. Yeah, thanks, Vanessa, for that. Um, Vanessa and I are uh, gotten to work with Julie Levy and the team there in Florida for, for many years. And I'd just like to give them kudos for having a great shelter medicine program, a good example for all of us interested in that field. But in particular today, I wanted to emphasize this website if you're struggling with maybe giving your PPE to human hospitals to help save people and protect uh, medical staff. If you have done some of those things like 
CSU and Paul from Wasaba to provide ventilator support to the human healthcare system. Uh, it's just been a great One Health uh, example of sharing and helping save people first. But that has led to some shortages. And so I share this particular website uh, because I learned how to sew a mask from doing this particular site. So again, uh, kudos to that program and some great guidance to you if you need to make some of your own PPP for your essential work in your veterinary practice. So we have a little short section now about, again, kind of re-emphasizing the odds type things. I know our staff at Colorado State University, the, the information when it started surfacing that some exposed people became infected, shed virus, but um, were not showing clinical signs. So it was a little bit harder to help predict what level of PPE to use with those people and or their pets. It does lead to a lot of discomfort. I'm glad to see that many countries, including ours, are now uh, seriously taking social distancing, lessening droplet transmission by masks within six feet. And we even wear our safety glasses when we have to work within three feet, like drawing a blood sample. So it's really important that we institute those measures. But the good news, tying back into likelihood of being infected, shedding time periods with high levels, we're getting more and more information now that those heavy shedding times are actually fairly early uh, in the clinical signs. And, and then, of course, sadly, probably the day before or so clinical signs develop. And so, so we do still have that kind of mystery from each person, potentially each companion animal. But some of the clustering uh, type cases, this early one from Singapore, where they did do some of the uh, contact tracing with people, uh, it is comforting to know that even though you were in an environment with people that were currently sick and likely to be shedding virus, that many of those folks were already dead in hosts and not every close contact person became infected. So I'm not saying by any stretch that you shouldn't use appropriate PPE while contacting people while the pandemic flattens. But the good news is if you do the right thing, your pet, your friends, your family, your staff can avoid this particular viral infection. So I think Vanessa and I are going to conclude the same here in a second. I'll let her make some points and we'll get ready for Shane. Get yourself ready, Shane. You're coming soon. Is that there is data now that suggests that a cat, dog, and ferret could be infected. So reverse zoonosis has been proven. We won't rehash each of these conclusions on this slide, but I think we can end this slide with there's still no evidence that that transient low-level shedding that a very small proportion of animals that were in contact with the COVID-19 COVID person can pass it to the next person. Any disagreement with that final conclusion, Vanessa? Absolutely no disagreement, uh, Mike. You know, over the more than 1.8 million cases of uh, COVID-19 now, there have been no no cases showing animal to human transmission. So I think we can be reassured about that. Great, thank you, thank you for that input. And so to start closing out uh, the Vanessa and Mike show, we obviously contact people, right? And so we're an at-risk population from contacting people, not so much the pets, but it's probably from those people. So as we uh, fight with our areas uh, to get permission to be essential services. And then when that's granted, what we're trying to do is make sure that we get chances to recognize the people that would be at greatest risk to our uh, staff. And so AVMA algorithms, the great algorithm from Scott Weiss's team there, that was published in Clinician's Brief, uh, starting on this side of the slide, working your way to the other side. Bottom line is the whole goal is to keep our staff and then ultimately ourselves uh, safe because we are a human contact uh, profession. So just to give you an example, all of our uh, cases now start with a phone call and uh, all those phone calls they're asked to voluntarily describe uh, these four uh, answers. 
so that we can make determinations. One, from the phone call, should their pet be seen at all? And two, if their pet should be seen, uh, what is the risk? So just one, one example. So uh, Shane, thanks again for uh, spearheading this press information sheet from a couple of, of um, gosh, six weeks or so ago now. I really think it's directly related to our governor in Colorado calling veterinarians a uh, essential service. And I also believe that that ultimately helped lead to uh, things like, yes, we can do more telemedicine for cases that could potentially be managed without physical contact. So I hope that's happening around the world. And uh, thanks for the stimulus from Wasaba. So this next little section, again, there's Mary again and, and Michael Day, our godfather. I really want to point out that I've never seen somebody herd a group of cats like vaccine specialists and get a statement published in 24 hours. That's the kind of influence our family friend Michael Day has uh, on the world. And so if you haven't taken a look at what the vaccine guidelines group had, had chatted about, with some of the prevention issues, people were becoming uh, quite uh, disturbed because we did have vaccines boosters, probably not on the essential list in the, the United States. And so veterinarians were providing my animal sick or traumatized type care, but not doing as much of the uh, maintenance type uh, case work that we often do. And so Michael's team did a great job uh, reminding us that the core vaccines, most of those have immunity that lasts much longer than label indication or even guideline recommended booster times. And so we can assure our clientele that their animal is not going to die of panleukopenia, parvovirus, distemper, or even rabies if it has already been well vaccinated and within two or three months of a pandemic lockdown from their last uh, recommended boosters. So the, the booster stuff with cores, probably not an issue at all. But I think a lot of the hand-wringing, uh, worrying type has been a little associated with what with, happened with us that had the lockdown, right with animals that had not finished their 16-week boosters. And so I think uh, the team's recommendation on this one is, is, is quite clear. While we're on a lockdown and if those vaccines aren't available to the owner to administer themselves, which they are in some countries, if they can't uh, have that happen, just sequester at home. If you avoid uh, areas with heavy concentrations of things like panleukopenia or parvo, which is easy to do in Fort Collins right now because the dog parks are closed because we're lessening social interactions. Bottom line is they probably can't be exposed then they can't have a, a, a infection break. And then as soon as restrictions lift, we'll get them finished off in their series. We really wanted to make the point that the canine enteric coronavirus, which is an alpha vaccination against that particular coronavirus with the currently available dog vaccines in certain countries, probably not going to do any good, even for enteric coronavirus. It's often debated whether or not it's needed at all, and it's certainly not going to induce any cross protection for SARS-CoV-2, and dogs are very difficult to infect. And then any of you that are having the temptation of, oh, maybe I'll use a dog vaccine to lessen my risk, that is a no-no as well. There's no cross protection. Please don't do that. And then those of us that live in countries that uh, Zoetis has their licensed uh, temperature-sensitive mutant FIP vaccine that sometimes helps control uh, FIP in catteries, there would also be no indication for that for these cats. Uh, again, you're not going to prevent COVID-19 uh, virus infection in kitties. And then the last thing for this particular prevention, just uh, informational, is uh, yeah, you, you could, if you missed several months of your heartworm prevention, uh, that could potentially leave your pet uh, at, at susceptible. 
there are different callback or reach back times for the different products. So you'll have to talk about product specific things with your client. But point is, is that if you do end up missing two or three months and you're fearful of that, make sure to get that follow up antigen test a couple hundred days uh, after the last dose was missed. And then same thing with flea and tech. If you just can't get your hands on flea and tech, just monitor in the interim period for clinical signs, fevers, uh, fatigue, et cetera, that would go along with flea or tick-borne diseases. And then if they're sick enough, they're now essential, and they'll, they'll come in, hopefully, for their work uh, and or their doxycycline. So right now, I have my favorites. Uh, I think Dr. Barr agrees with uh, these as well. And we'll soon have information on our iscade.org guidelines as well, our website. But these give you pretty balanced information most of the time. And then our colleague with Iscade, who's also helped us with Wasava, I don't know when Scott sleeps, but he gives great uh, blog updates on opinions about new information that we publish. So stick with your OIE, your CDC, your local uh, association guidelines, and hopefully uh, we'll get through this all together uh, fairly quickly. So I don't know if Vanessa has any other closing remarks for our part. It's time for our discussion from our president about some of the animal welfare issues. Anything closing from you, Dr. Bars? Thank you to Wasava. Thank you all for your time and please stay safe. And I agree with those statements. Handing off to our president, <clears throat> Dr. Ryan. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Lappin and Dr. Bars. Really appreciate the information that you shared. It's always great when we have things come through as the facts. Certainly, we know that things are changing sometimes minute by minute, <clears throat> um, but it is certainly great to be aware that as of right now, there is no evidence of transmission of COVID-19 from a pet to a human. Uh, and you know, we will certainly be staying posted on that as well. <clears throat> that is just some great news. Um, thanks again for your time. And we would like to transition now uh, to, as Dr. Lappin mentioned, Dr. Shane Ryan, who uh, is the Wasaba president and uh, is someone who has been an absolute driving force in uh, veterinary medicine, uh, not only in Asia, he's based out of Singapore, but really around the world. So uh, we are really honored to have him here today as well. Dr. Ryan did his veterinary training at the University of Queensland, his master's at Murdoch University, and he has been in practice in Singapore for many, many years. And uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Ryan. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. And hello, everyone, and good evening from Singapore. And that was an uh, excellent overview, guys, of uh, the current status and evidence regarding SARS-CoV-2 and companion animals. On, and I found it very interesting. What I'm going to do, I'm going to very briefly talk about animal welfare during the COVID-19 pandemic, the role of the veterinarian, the importance of the human-animal bond, and the stresses the pandemic may put on that bond. Um, before we start, what do we mean by the human-animal bond? It's uh, quite a number of very uh, de definitions out there. There's one I particularly like from the American Veterinary Medical Association that refers to the interdependency of pets and their owners. And I've paraphrased it here as a mutually beneficial relationship between people and pets. So mutually beneficial uh, is benefit obviously for the pet, but also for the pet owner. And this relationship includes not just the physical interactions of people with their pets, but also, uh, which is like the feeding and the touching and the grooming, the exercising, et cetera, but also the emotional and psychological interaction between people, animals, and the environment that they share. And that is analogous to One Health, the interconnectivity, the interdependence between human, animal, and environmental health and welfare. 
And the human animal bond is dependent upon the relationship between the pet and the pet owner being maintained and enhanced. And the relationship is heavily impacted by the health and behavior of both the companion animal and the animal owner. There are two aspects of animal welfare I'd like to very briefly touch upon today or tonight. First is the animal welfare, is animal welfare related to the veterinary visit in this time of the pandemic? And then animal welfare, the human animal bond from the point of view of owners looking after pets during quarantine and or social isolation. For many, if not most of us, this is a time of movement restrictions, social distancing, and conservation of the resources needed for our medical colleagues. And so equipment and supplies, including personal protective equipment, the PPE needed by veterinary teams may be in short supply. And private veterinary practices may need not, or may need to, they may be required to restrict themselves to emergency and or urgent cases only. Um, this does help limit and conserve the use of equipment and PPE, but it also allows for appropriate social distancing without overcrowding practices and decrease the risk of exposure of the veterinary team and also their clients. So we've talked about emergency and urgent cases, but what are they? What constitutes essential veterinary services? That does depend on your perspective. An owner's view of the seriousness of their pet's problem is quite likely different to the veterinarians or the regulatory authorities. But for ease of understanding, for clarity, some associations such as the BSAVA and my own home association, the SVA, have produced guides or triage tools as you can see here. And I'm sure many others have done something similar. From my uh, my, my point of view is that anything that seriously compromises animal welfare, that causes pain or has the potential to badly disrupt the human-animal bond is at least an urgent case and should be attended to if at all possible. And as Mike said, we have all this, well, not all, but most of these resources on our COVID-19 webpage. Please go along and have a look. You can grab a lot of useful information there. When we're practicing social distancing from clients, managing the pet coming into the clinic in the best possible welfare manner may be challenging. So how do you safely examine that pet, still ensure the health and safety of the veterinary team and minimize any negative welfare impacts on the animal concerned? If you're restricting public access to the clinic or practicing curbside visits, the owner will likely not be present during the consultation. So prior to the visit, and this has been referred to earlier, get health declarations from the owner electronically, ideally, and we all have, well, not all, but most of us have mobile devices that we could do that with, but also ask for the history and the signalment so that much of the information uh, needed to start the diagnostic process or the treatment is obtained in advance of the animal entering the clinic. So the time away from the owner is minimised and the animal's time under these stressful circumstances is decreased. If possible and if time permits, have a brief discussion with the pet owner on how their pet will be managed while they are not present. They will be concerned. How any outdoor exchange will occur if it is going to happen. How are you going to take control and care and responsibility for their pet? What are the expectations of the owner for this particular case? What are their primary concerns and issues to make sure that they're addressed? And tell them how their pet will be managed um, physically in the clinic while they're not there. I'm not sure how to answer that. And then, sorry about that, my phone is talking to me. And then also any medical or surgical management, which can be discussed at the time of consultation through electronic devices, tablets, phones, et cetera, but certainly post visit. It is always, always important to try to alleviate the stress and anxiety that an animal may encounter during the veterinary visit. Um, if, if it's an emergency situation or an urgent case, physical stress is already likely, but we can try to mitigate the psychological and emotional stresses 
and any information that the owner can provide in advance, such as whether the cat or dog has issues being restrained or put on tables or the preferred use of treats, if that's appropriate under the circumstances. Uh, circumstances. This may help ameliorate some of the difficulties and alleviate the animal's anxiety and stress. For example, the use of pheromone sprays on PPE. If you're going out to collect the animal dressed in uh, a space suit, it may seem quite unusual for that dog. Pheromone sprays may help. Using treats to encourage or lure the pet into the clinic rather than pulling them on a leash. And if the visit is urgent but not an emergency, then pre-visit medications such as anxiolytics can be discussed. Um, I think Vanessa uh, briefly alluded to the safe transport strategy about contaminated fomites. Uh, it's important to consider this uh, when you're transferring carriers and cages. I'm not going to discuss this now because we simply just don't have the time, but please be aware of that. And if you need any additional information on welfare visits surrounding, surrounding the veterinary visit at any time, we have an excellent uh, guidelines out there, the Animal Welfare Guidelines, and Chapter 3 specifically talks about this. So please go to the website and download it. Oh, and I was looking on the internet uh, just the other day, and I found some very useful information from Fear Free, whom I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that is worth uh, investigating. And there was a very good webinar called Veterinary Medicine During COVID-19. I would encourage you to go and have a look at it. And finally, the human-animal bond and animal welfare from the point of view of owners looking after their pets during this time of social isolation and restriction of movement. Living in closer proximity, and it's not just physical proximity, but temporal proximity to people and their pets in the household can increase stress. So instead of being in close proximity for a few hours a day, there may be contact for extended periods or possibly even 24 hours a day. And that can put a strain on any relationship, whether human to human, animal to human, or human to animal. Previously, the pet would have had a set schedule that it was used to, being taken for walks at certain times, had set feeding times, and this provided the pet stability and certainty in its daily routine. And then suddenly, there's always people at home. There may be change in timings of when they go for an exercise. Maybe they can't go for a walk, or if they do, they cannot interact with other people or animals as they used to because we practice social distancing. And these changes, which have been quite sudden, these schedule disruptions, will create anxiety and stress in many pets. And this may manifest as behavioural changes that can put strain on the human-animal bond. You don't want your cat walking all over your keyboard or the puppy pulling at your sleeve or biting at your feet while you're doing a telemedicine consultation or homeschooling your children. So set boundaries. They help support the human-animal bond, both physical and temporal boundaries. Physical boundaries, there may be parts of the house that become off limits, instead have areas where the pet is encouraged to engage with the owner. Uh, and temporal boundaries, establish a schedule when the pet can engage in these areas, have play times and quiet times and cues for those times. And this new schedule, this new program may take some time for the pet to learn and understand but once it's established, once the schedule has been developed, it's important it's adhered to. Something that is random and ad hoc is not going to help the pet behaviour. Uh, it's not going to help the stability that it needs and there's possibility of behaviours that will damage the human-animal bond as a result of this stress and anxiety. So a quick summary. The veterinarian's role. Now, this is not the role uh, of veterinarians just during COVID-19. Many of these are valid for any time, but a couple I would like to just point out here is to counter misinformation. We've talked about this with, uh, with uh, Vanessa and Mike. Um, the misinformation out there has already led to pet abandonment, euthanasia, surrenders, and even media reports of owners killing their pets, throwing them off balconies, which is terrible. They rely on us to provide scientific, validated information they can take home 
and be sure of. And after tonight, I'm sure that will help them even more. You can pass it on to that one. The other one that I've just marked up there, custodians of the human animal bond or the companion animal bond. I was going to very briefly talk about domestic violence and I have not time here to talk about the impact of enforced close proximity and the increased possibility of domestic violence, but just be aware that animal abuse or animal welfare issues in pets may flag issues in the home environment. Hopefully you won't have to encounter that. And finally, a quote from Maggie O'Hare at Purdue, uh, and I'm sure it's something that our companion animal veterinarians are well aware of. I would say that companion animal, uh, that animal companionship is already an important source of social support and it's probably becoming more so in these stressful times in this pandemic. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. And I will get out of my screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan. Really appreciate that. And I want to thank Wasava and Tarina uh, on behalf of Zoetis, as well as all of our presenters. There was a tremendous amount of work that got done to prepare for this in a very short period of time. And our presenters all donated their time to put forth that effort. And we sincerely appreciate it. The information that you have provided today is a fantastic overview of the facts. And I really appreciate Dr. Ryan that you highlighted the importance of veterinarians in ensuring animal welfare. And through these uncertain times, there's gonna be lots of change. We're gonna to have to figure out what the new normal is. I don't believe that anyone knows right now what that may or may not wind up looking like. But one of the things that I believe has been well studied and well known, and I've certainly experienced myself, is the power of the human animal bond and the unconditional love that we can get from pets. And that's something that uh, it's a privilege that we as veterinarians get to provide support for that bond. And so that's something that uh, we hope everyone who has viewed this is walking away with some new thoughts as to how they might support that um, and hopefully uh, feeling invigorated to uh, keep on keeping on. So um, thank you to all. A um, few housekeeping issues I wanted to mention. Uh, we have received some questions during the webinar, and I want to assure everyone that we will be reviewing and addressing those. Uh, we've also had a question regarding, will this webinar be translated? And it will be um, several days before we have translations available, but we will be going into multiple languages uh, with a transcript that we will be able to provide for everyone. So, Thank you so much for your time and effort. And I want to wish everyone the best, um, be safe, and uh, we will uh, continue with information um, as we uh, have updates and as things change. Um, one of the last things that I would like to mention is if you found this webinar to be helpful, if you could please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. Uh, one of the things that we will be looking at moving forward is the best modalities to share updated information. Um, and that is something that uh, we would like to kind of gauge on the webinar. So if you like this, then you can give it a thumbs up. That would be wonderful. And with that, I would like to wish everyone the best and thank you for your time.